Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt, joined now by Admiral Stavridis, 33 years in the United States Navy, now retired, former Allied Supreme Commander of NATO, former head of Southern Command, and uh, all around good guy. You know, uh, Admiral, good morning. How are you? Doing well, sir. I liked your uh, open it up music. That's Clocks by Coldplay. Very. You've got it down. You've got it down. I, I hope your ears were burning on when on Thursday morning. Uh, Q Lee, uh, co-chief executive officer of the Carlisle Group, and I were together. I did an event with Paul Begala for their uh, their senior investor uh, committee. And I was telling him, what does uh, Admiral Stavridis do? And he says, you know, he thinks for us. That's a pretty good job. <laughs> That's a pretty good job. Only if they pay you for it. I know. but, but uh, Yeah, I'm enjoying it greatly. I have a wonderful time at the Carlisle Group with uh, both Q Song Lee and our co-CEO, Glenn Young, and it's a good team. It was. It was terrific. But uh, I, I really would love to come someday and see how they have it set up, because that much brain power in one place threatens to have some kind of chain reaction. Admiral, I, I got a lot to cover with you this morning. First, I want to cover with you a sensitive topic. I know that the Vice President Joe Biden is your friend. I know that. And uh, he had a bad debate last night, largely because of this line. Play the radio. Make sure the television, the, excuse me, make sure you have the record player on at night. The, the, the phone... Uh, Joe Castro, Cory Booker, others have raised the question, he's too old. I want to take it out of the political context and put it in the military context. What happens when you see an officer, and it's always going to be a senior officer, who may just have lost uh, the edge they need to command? What does the military do in that situation? We typically don't hit that situation. I can't think of an instance where we have, and it's it's quite simple, it's because of if you will, the term limits known as age in the military. Um, you only serve 30 years on active duty unless you're a flag or general officer. Then you could serve a handful of additional years, say another three to five years. But um, I've never seen a senior officer have senior moments. Did Admiral that, that Rickover point. get to that level? No, he did not. Uh, and you're you're smart to raise him. He is kind of the one exception. He served longer in uniform than any other figure in American history. I think he served uh, close to 60 years in uniform uh, and was sharp and as vicious as a knife uh, well into his senior years. Yeah, it's possible to do that. It's just when you have the amplification of every word via social media and then radio and television the next morning, it's tough to escape this ball and chain like uh, like that quote. Let me let me shift over to what I'm doing tonight. I have the unenviable job and yet the great privilege of interviewing your friend, uh, General James Mattis, tonight at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda. You're going to be the second in our Jack Brennan Distinguished Speakers series in October. This is only for senior military officers who have written a book. And I'm going to have a dinner beforehand with a bunch of young junior officers to talk to the general. And when you come, we're going to have a bunch of junior officers from the Navy to talk to you. That Then we'll do a big event to talk about the book and sell books. But as I've been reading this, there is a great commonality between your books and his book, which is the emphasis on reading. He goes so far as to say, not only is it idiotic, it is unethical for an officer not to be always reading. I'll unpack it for us, what you think that means. Uh, Jim Mattis, one of my oldest friends and uh, somebody I've looked up to. He's about uh, four or five years older than I am and has been a, a mentor and an advisor to me. And the biggest thing we share is a love of books. And if you flip over my book, uh, one of them is called The Leader's Bookshelf. You'll see a quote from General Jim Mattis on the back of it. Um, leaders have to read uh, tactically, Hugh, in order to know what's happening of the day. Uh, when I was a very young officer, I would go to work on my first ship, and my boss would sit down and read the newspaper page by page. And I'd say, sir, we've got a lot to do. Why are you doing that? He said, because the first duty of an officer is to know what's going on in the world. So you've got to read tactically. Secondly, operationally, you have to be able to read at scale, on the world and understand what's going on in these various theaters of operations. And thirdly, and most importantly, I think, and this is where the Jim Mattis quote comes in, you have to read strategically, which is you have to build character, you have to build intellectual content um, to be thinking long-term about events. That's history, geography, biography. Some novels think The Killer Angels by Michael Shera, that is a novel about the generals in the Civil War. Think uh, Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield about the Battle of Thermopylae. Think of Churchill's writing. 
Think of some of Nixon and Kissinger's writing. That's strategic reading. So you've got to be able to do all three. He has an appendix, which I have not yet cross-referenced to your leader's bookshelf, one of my favorite books that I give to young people so that they have a reading list is Admiral Stavridis' uh, The Leader's Bookshelf. He has a list of 64 books. I've only read a third of them. I mean, I felt so stupid at the end of this book. It's an instant classic, by the way, uh, Call Sign Chaos. Do you know what chaos stands for? I do. Uh, Colonel has an outstanding solution. Yes. An acronym. <laughs> and it's kind of a, yeah, it's a little tongue in cheek jab at Jim because um, every time the staff would come up with, uh, they thought a brilliant plan, uh, Jim would come in and have like one more big idea to jam into it. And uh, that's where the call sign came from. By the way, he hates the call sign or the name Mad Dog. Never was his. Don't call him that. Okay, good advice. I will not use it tonight. I'm going to use chaos. Uh, Colonel yes. has another outstanding solution. That was on a whiteboard that he walked into. I found exactly. it very, very amusing. There are a couple of things I wanted you to comment on. The first was, he said the biggest problem for commanders in the field today is the aura of omniscience back in Washington, D.C. by people not in the Pentagon. What do you think he means by that? He's talking about the interagency. So the Pentagon is very much in the chain of command. It runs from the most junior soldiers and sailors up through the colonels and the captains to the admirals and the generals, back to the joint staff, to the secretary of defense, to the president. That's the chain of command. It's a, it's a unitary line. What happens in Washington is over at State Department, over at the National Security Council staff, over at the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of the Treasury. Uh, there are a lot of colonels who have outstanding ideas. There is a lot of chaos in that network of the interagency because so many people are piping information in, and occasionally they start to jump the chain of command. When I was the NATO commander, Supreme Allied Commander, occasionally I get phone calls from some mid-level staffer on the NSC, the National Security Council staff, saying, oh, Supreme Allied Commander, the president would really like you to do this or that, I would politely hang up, call my boss, uh, Secretary of Defense Gates, and say, sir, I'm getting some static or white noise coming from the White House. Can you run that down for me? And if you want me to do something, let me know. But that wastes time. So that's what Mattis is talking about, the sense in Washington of the interagency that it can dip into the military process. Very dangerous. Now, I had actually forgotten, and maybe it's because his tour was shortened, that he had uh, held the same job you held, which is Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. His reflections on that period of time and ha had not yet occurred to me. That's why I wanted to ask you about him, that when you're commanding nations, uh, officers of nations other than your own, they have certain restrictions and cultures very different from ours, and it makes military discipline a much more uh, complex, I won't say difficult, much more complex set of uh, calculations, including if I send this officer home, will it damage the relations between NATO and the officer and, Na and the country of uh, resident country and the United States? How often did you run into that? Because that seems to me to be a very tricky situation. Yeah, constantly. So I held the job for four years and was the Supreme Allied Commander for operations globally. Um, big, big, complex job. The job that Jim Mattis had was Supreme Allied Commander for Transformation, which is in Norfolk, Virginia. It's a non-operational command. Uh, and it's in charge of coming up with new ideas for the alliance. But, and he held it for, I think, less than two years. But I think both of us would agree that it is a tower of Babel out there in the NATO alliance. Now, that has some good to it, Hugh, because you get a lot of different viewpoints. You get fresh ways of thinking and doing things when you see how the Italians do things, or the Brits do things, or the French do things, or the Bulgarians do things. On the other hand, uh, it becomes static in the line when you try and apply uh, U.S. norms of behavior in a military chain of command, which are compassionate leadership, listening to subordinates, making decisive decisions, all the things we do typically. Uh, but other nations don't always follow that model. And so when you fight in these coalitions, you have to be able to work through that static. The last thing I'll say is, to quote Winston Churchill, um, the worst thing about uh, fighting is fighting without any allies. 
Uh, that that takes me to my last point. Um, he writes, history is compelling. I don't have the book in front of me, so I hope it's a, an exact quote. History is compelling. Nations with allies thrive. Nations without them wither. I think you agree with that. 100%. And um, I always felt that kind of intuitively. But when I became the NATO commander, despite all the difficulties, despite all the static that Jim and I would both recognize, we both would have signed up with Churchill's view that uh, the best thing you can have are allies. And we've shown that again and again. And let's face it, Hugh, China has no allies. Russia has no allies in the sense that we have NATO. We have the nations of the organizations of American states. We have our, our allies in the Pacific, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, on and on and on. That's our greatest strength. And that is a fundamental part of Jim Mattis's worldview and mine as well. Now, I want to do one more fact and get a reaction from you, not a question. The U.S. Navy and PLA Navy Commission 2015 to 2018, our friend Captain Hendricks sent this to me yesterday, uh, China put 85 combatant ships into the uh, water between 2015 and 2018. We put in 22. If you take that trend line out, that is a disaster for us. It absolutely is. And it's not just numbers of ships. The pat answer would be, oh, but our ships have so much more capability. And they do. But quantity has a quality all its own, as the saying goes. And secondly, these are not just low-end ships. Increasingly, these are platforms that will carry hypersonic cruise missiles, are very capable in cyber warfare. Some of them are gray zone vessels that can uh, operate in a Q-ship fashion. And finally, they are building nuclear aircraft carriers. They are on track to do that. Um, we are going to face great, great challenges from China, not only in the South China Sea, but globally. Admiral James Stavridis, the uh, former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO for operations, not transformation. I've got a new, new arrow in my quiver this morning. The stuff civilians learn when they actually talk to people who know things. It's amazing. Thank you, Admiral Stav. His, his uh, website is admiralstav.com.